Good evening and good to have you with us in the 9 p.m. edition of the Urban Debate. This one is going to be a little different from what we do every single day on Urban Debate. It's not going to be essentially a debate in this edition. This show tonight is dedicated to those COVID warriors who are out there on field, in the front line, battling the war and saving lives. Essentially, battling India's COVID war and saving you and me and our loved ones. Now, you may say, we've done so many of these shows, what is the point now? And I'll tell you what, I'm a little done with the hypocrisy of salute the COVID warriors when we don't show that in reality. And I have personally now seen far too many appeals and desperate requests from the medical fraternity asking India to help them, to simply support them in this battle. All we have to do is follow the COVID norms. That is all that we have to do. Theirs is a tougher job any which way because it's the doctors and the nurses and the rest of the medical staff who are actually working day in and day out. Day in and day out, treating people. They are the ones who have to say no every time the hospital is full. Every time they don't have a ventilator available. Every time they don't have enough oxygen available. They are the ones who have to break the bad news to a family. That their loved one is no more. They are the ones who are working. 12 hours, 14 hours, 18 hours, non-stop, week after week for the past 13 months in these horrible PP kits and shields and masks. They're the ones who have to stay away from their families or risk getting them exposed. They have missed weddings, they have missed funerals, they have missed the birth of their own babies and every other landmark because for them saving lives comes first. And what have we done? apart from lighting candles and banging utensils. We have gone and traveled. We have attended weddings. We have attended parties. We have socialized when we knew we shouldn't be. We have attended religious gatherings. We've celebrated festivals. We continue to hold political rallies and mailers despite repeated warnings, despite the cases surging every day. So tonight I'm giving this platform to our COVID warriors to not just say thank you to them because frankly I don't think they care about our thank you anymore but to allow them to get this message out to people of just what is required of the common man of the kind of stress mental and physical that our COVID warriors are undergoing and what is it that we can do to support them in this war for the country that's all that we want to highlight here so let me say good evening. Dr. Venkat Ramesh works with Apollo Hospitals in Hyderabad. Dr. Sandesh Khandelwal, he's with the Victoria Hospital in Bengaluru. Dr. Jagdish Shiremat with the ACE Multi Specialty Hospital in Bengaluru. Dr. Mansi Khanderia, consultant medical oncologist with hospital in Bengaluru. Dr. Shah Nawaz who is with the, with the Max Hospital in the National Capital. And we'll have more and more joining us in the next one hour. I want to start off with Dr. Venkat. Uh, Dr. Venkat, firstly, congratulations to you. I'm told you were recently blessed with uh, two little baby girls. Uh, and I can imagine how difficult this, it is for you to stay away from your family at this time, from your two little children, and to be working, but you have to do that. And, and go ahead, this platform is yours to spread the message that you want to, to the people of this country. First of all, um, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, they mean a lot to us. So what we have been seeing recently is a massive surge in the number of infections. We are seeing patients coming in at a much younger age, much more sicker than they were coming in in the first wave. We are also seeing that these patients 
are not responding to uh, treatment as much as they did in the first wave, which essentially means that they have a much higher viral burden. What we are also seeing is a number of people in the same household being affected. Sometimes every member in the household has been affected. And invariably, some of them need to be hospitalized. And then the same cycle of finding a hospital bed, uh, going into the ICU, being on the ventilator, and so on continues. It is uh, very worrying not only that we have 200,000 cases a day, but the time it has taken from us to come from 15 or 20,000 cases a day to 10 times that number. In the first wave, it, didn't, it took a number of months to reach 97 or 98,000 cases. But at this time, the rapidity with which we have increased the case numbers in the country is truly worrying. We do not know as yet if we are at the peak or if we are still going to reach the peak and if things are going to get better or worse. So my appeal to the people of India is essentially two things. One is limit your exposure. Uh, I remember in the first wave, there was this message being circulated as to treat every person you meet, uh, treat them as if they were infected. In the sense, when you meet them, practice COVID-appropriate behavior with masks, physical distancing, and avoid all unnecessary interactions and travel. The second thing is to promote vaccinations amongst those who are 45 and above. That is, anybody born in 1976 or earlier is eligible as per the government of India to receive a vaccine. What saddens me nowadays is I still see patients coming in who are above 60, above 70, who haven't received their first dose of vaccine. And these patients are at much higher risk of disease. So it is essential that we vaccinate whoever is eligible and we promote uh, vaccination. The last point I would like to mention is in this wave that we're seeing patients coming in at a much younger age, that is less than 40, and even in some cases less than 30 with what is called severe or critical COVID. Mm. Well, Although I'm not a pediatrician, I have also heard of babies being affected and children being affected in this yes. wave. So this is essentially uh, the crux of the matter. Yes, absolutely. In fact, just today we, we, we had some analysis that we did of numbers in terms of the pace of infection even, even amongst children uh, and, and younger ones. Uh, and that is concerning. And all that we have to do, and the only thing actually that will help us right now, is for us to st start following the COVID norms. Because for everything else, we are running short of. We are running short of oxygen, we are running short of ventilators, and, and, and you all know this better than anybody else does. Dr. Mansi, uh, good evening to you. Good evening. How have the past 13 months been? How do you tell yourself that you need to go this and do it all over again for another wave and perhaps after that another wave while people don't seem to care at all? Yeah, thank you for bringing this up. You know, like it's been 13 months and most of us have been wearing an N95 mask along with a visor for at least six to eight hours a day. These, I mean, the healthcare workers. And after we come home, wearing a cloth mask is like a breeze for us. But when we see people, uh, you know, refusing to even wear a mask while stepping out for a few minutes or a few hours, it is just too heartbreaking for us. It's extremely uh, reckless, lazy and selfish of people to not just pull up the mask because that's the least everybody could do. And that's the only request I have today. I have a few uh, few requests that I have uh, to everybody. Please stay home if your work and livelihood permits. 
If you do have to step out for an essential work, kindly wear a mask appropriately over the nose, surrounding your mouth entirely. Avoid mask gatherings, be it religious, political, or social. Please get vaccinated if eligible. Please do not stigmatize families who are suffering from COVID and try to help these families as far as possible. And lastly, and mainly, for non-emergency medical complaints and chronic diseases, kindly seek medical advice on video consultations so that patients who need urgent medical attention, ICU care, and those with cancer and dialysis, on dialysis, can get timely care without risks and delay. So I'm a cancer specialist and my patients need continuum of care. And COVID has badly affected it. In fact, we are seeing more and more cancers which have accumulated over the past year and a lot of them who could have been cured in the last year have progression, metastatic disease, which is as deadly or even worse than COVID. So please uh, encourage patients with chronic conditions like cancer to reach out to the doctor and please do not crowd the hospitals for minute complaints. That's the least people could do to help us over exhausted mentally and physically exhausted doctors to not have a breakdown thank you yes and and, and to deal with the gravity of this every day to see this the, you know the dark depressing side of this reality of the covid mess that we are in every single day uh, and i can only imagine for you uh, uh, dr mansi for your patients and for you know when you're not able to give them that timely treatment because there is this other thing that's also taken precedence uh, would it be even more distressing. Uh, what, what about you, Dr. Sandesh? How has your interaction been? How often do you actually come across um, COVID patients who probably wouldn't have gotten it had they shown a little bit of care, had they not gone for a holy party or a mela or, you know, a gathering that could they could have definitely avoided? Uh, yes, sir. thank you for the uh, opportunity. I think we should uh, condemn all the activities irrespective of the political parties or religious guard, uh, gathering irrespective of any religion, be it anything. See, this is the time where we should be extra cautious. Uh, see, the waves, wave, second wave is actually a dangerous situation. Younger patients are suffering. They are having even critical illness. So what is the situation now? If I go to hospital, I see more crowd in front of a tea shop than the vaccine. Uh, center. Why is it happening? Why we are not, you know, uh, telling people to go and vaccinate? Uh, one thing which I actually having a doubt, why Indian government is also confusing people? Why our health minister is going and, you know, saying something about coronal that it is effective? We should not confuse people. If one on the one way you are saying that you should vaccinate, it will help us. On the other way, you are saying coronal is effective. If it is effective, why the coronal is spreading in our country? So you should be very careful about it. It is basically by confusing the people, you are basically decreasing the efforts which we all are putting. So these rumors should be stopped. One thing which I wanted to put. Another thing is, see, uh, everyone will start saying that vaccine, uh, we should open it for all and all. So we cannot say it, how is the situation right now. Government is trying their best to give it to all the people. But Till then, we should consider one thing that mask is super vaccine. I have been working from 13 months. I have done COVID duties also. I have operated on the patients. Some patients even turned positive. Later, we come to know that they are COVID positive because we cannot deny surgery to emergency cases. In such cases, only the mask, that N95 mask and shield has protected me till now. So it is actually a critical phase right now and mm. everyone should behave maturely. Uh, especially Sandesh. the young people who go out are roaming around on the roads and then they infect their elder people. So all those things should be taken care of. How, that, that, and does it infuriate you, Dr. Sandesh, does it, uh, uh, you know, to see when youngsters do that, when, you know, um, educated, well aware youngsters do that? I believe um, you, you, you have a wife and a one year old who had to uh, be, you know, kept separately at some, at one point you didn't have an option, but to send them to the hometown. How long did you have to stay, you know, away from your family because you were doing this work? Yeah, exactly. Last time, last year, it was the same situation. I was on COVID duty and my son was, you know, uh, quite young. It was, a, he was around six to eight months. So I have to send my wife. She was not working at that time. She's also a doctor. But right now, the situation is she's on duty right now. So if she's on night duty, I have to be at home. 
so I cannot avoid contact with my son. So obviously we are putting our whole family into risk. So the Indian people should also behave maturely and consider this that we are helping out people. We are ready to do anything. We are trying to contact uh, to different cities with our contacts. We are allowed, trying to arrange bed for them, ar arrange medicine for them. But this is what is you know minimum required from all the people in India that they should uh, follow COVID appropriate behavior. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Jagdish. Uh, I mean, of course, it's been tough time for uh, each one of you, and and but I want to talk about it and bring it out because often for you know a uh, a common man we choose to not see the human side of the other person for for we will just see you as a doctor whose job is to give me a bed and give me medicines and answer all my questions uh, and save my loved one's life uh, we often tend to forget that you too would have a family and you would have risked yourself day after day after day to come and do this uh, you want me to answer this question? Well, I want you to tell your story of how difficult it has been and how did you prepare yourself when you saw the second wave coming? See, it has been uh, very difficult here. Uh, one part is that, yes, I am a doctor, I am an intensivist, I, am, I have taken care of uh, many of the COVID patients uh, who were admitted uh, in our hospital, uh, even during the first wave and who are getting admitted uh, in our hospital even now continuously. Uh, I've been in this field for almost uh, 22 years now and at this age I am coming here and doing uh, night duties. That's something uh, you know uh, very very tough uh, to do because I in, in the meanwhile being a hospital owner myself I've got used to certain amount of luxuries but now since there is such a huge demand of personnel, of doctors, of nurses uh, to come and work with these patients, at least in the initial first wave, we had a very, very difficult situation where many nurses, there was a lot of scaremongering, the housekeeping, there was a lot of scaremongering. They never wanted to come back to hospitals. The moment we took a patient, COVID positive patient, I have seen a situation where uh, we had to hire people giving them three times the salary just to go there and clean the rooms of the patients who were admitted in the hospital in the COVID wards. So it's it's not an easy job at all. It's It's been a very tough job. On top of it, you have the authorities sitting on our neck and telling and dictating terms to us, telling you should do this, you should do that. That's been very distressing at times because you're doing everything as a doctor to save a patient, add to it the additional burden of being the administrator of a hospital. You not only have to take care of the patient, you also have to answer the authorities who somehow presume that they have a right over your life and your hospital. So, um, which which was built with first with our hard earned money. So we have gone through all this, but of course um, we were able to save a big number of patients. That's a that's one good plus. And even now, like I think one of the doctors here did mention about children getting affected. My hospital has seen big number of uh, children who got admitted because. The families got admitted together, the father, the mother, the child, and in, in one case, three kids, all were positive. I don't even understand what was the necessity to be so careless among these people to come to this stage and get admitted in the hospital. In, in one particular case, there are two families right now in the hospital where where all the family members are admitted in the hospital with small kids. Uh, there is one five month old kid who had developed skin rashes because of COVID who recovered and went back. But again, there was a recurrence for the mother. Now the mother is back. The child and father are, are away at home taking care of themselves. I don't know with whose help. Because again, there is a small quarantine thing going on, micro quarantine thing going on with them. 
I don't understand how it is affecting their families. Everybody is getting affected. Yeah. All I request to the people is, you know, first have it have COVID appropriate behavior. And and in my understanding now, what I finally want to actually tell is, eventually everybody will be infected, yeah. or every or everybody will get vaccinated. So one of the two is going to happen. Government has to use its senses and vaccinate people at the fastest clip possible, fastest pace possible. Well, I we think some, some steps are being taken there now, uh, perhaps a little uh, late, uh, but at least now is better than never, where they've started to, you know, change policies to bring in some foreign vaccines or ramp up the production here, tie up with other manufacturers. I mean, it, it's difficult to imagine why in, in the vaccine hub of the world uh, we have moved at such a slow pace. But I think that's now changing We'll perhaps see the impact in, in a few months. But Dr. Shah Nawaz, uh, you know, I think it, it hits home and people only realize the gravity of it if it happens to them or somebody in their family or a close person. Now, while we don't want to wait for that, perhaps another way of explaining this to people can be that even if you have other issues, your treatment and your access to healthcare may get hit if COVID wave continues in such a manner, because when everything else is focused on COVID, the non-COVID patients are actually bearing the brand as well. Hello. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the invite. Yeah, that is a very important point. You just mentioned that, uh, see, our hospitals and our infrastructure and our manpower before even this COVID pandemic emerged, we were already doing the job. The hospitals were already full. Our infrastructure, we can say, is not the best in the world. But whatever we had, it was its full capacity. Then this pandemic happened. So once we allocate the beds and the people for this pandemic, that means we are taking them away from someone else. This is something we need to understand. There are patients in the hospital who are suffering from the cancer or who need dialysis twice or thrice a week or who are organ transplant recipients who are immunocompromised, who have to have regular checkups. But once we dedicate a full hospital or a part of it to COVID, that means we are taking somebody's care away from them. And it is a very important issue which uh, probably we are not paying enough attention that non-COVID patients are also suffering besides the COVID patients. So right now, we are not just facing one pandemic. One pandemic is the COVID. The other is those patients which were initially being treated, and now they are being ignored, or their treatment, their care is getting delayed because there is so much rush in the hospital. The beds are not available, or the personnel are busy doing are attending the COVID patient. So this is something very important we need to think about. So uh, I would suggest like uh, we need to ramp up our healthcare facilities and uh, our healthcare infrastructure has never been uh, having redundant capacity so that it had a 20% extra capacity. It has always been running to its full capacity. So right, today is the right time so that we ramp up our facilities so that extra beds are created, extra staff is hired, extra nurses are hired, and those will be the people which will provide care to those patients which are non-COVID and need the care desperately. And uh, besides, we have, uh, uh, we have to understand that there are responsibilities. As a healthcare professional, as a doctor, I have my responsibilities, yeah. but there are responsibilities on the people there are responsibilities on the administration. So both administration as well as people have to do their bit. We cannot put the whole blame on people or on the administration. Both are equally important. People need to wear masks. And I would stress on it that people, if they can, they should wear N95 masks whenever in public or at least a surgical mask. And least is the cloth mask. Nowadays, it has become very fashionable that anybody, everybody is preferring cloth mask, but preference should be N95 mask. 
And the second step and the most important thing for the public to do, for the public to do is to avoid gatherings and to go for vaccination if it is available to them. Yeah. For administration, they have also their responsibilities. It is the responsibility of administration to ramp up the infrastructure, to provide more beds. As a doctor, I cannot provide a bed to a patient if it is not existing in the hospital. If I get a phone call for a bed or a patient lands up at the door of the hospital and there is no bed inside, how can I? So it is the administration has the responsibility to ramp up the infrastructure and to provide vaccines. This is the right time and uh, I think this is already we are late, but uh, better late than ever. We right now need to open vaccination for all the adults, all the uh, people above 18 should get vaccine as soon as possible. This should be a top priority for admin right now. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, the one point that you raised about how when things are not in your hands and everybody is reaching out to you to help them, I think uh, everybody here on the panel would have gone through it. Uh, I'm also reading, you know, some of the appeals that were put out on social media. And I want to read these out to people because these are just like our panelists. These are voices of, uh, you know, from the medical fraternity of what they are feeling uh, and, and what they're trying to get through as a message to all of you and all of us. Uh, Shankul Devedi actually tweeted saying various people, doctors, medical students, journalists, general public relatives are getting in touch with me multiple times for ICU beds, injections, uh, or remdesivir last week. I felt really helpless as I was of little help and had to say sorry to so many. Feeling is really uh, upsetting. The message there being hashtag mask up India. Uh, I also saw, uh, you know, Kala Titham who tweeted saying situation is quite grim. We're taking care of more sick people and sicker people than we saw during the first wave. Fortunately, they are young and fighting well for us. Unfortunately, also, they are young and that could mean a huge loss for this nation. Uh, in, in fact, uh, m m one of the tweets that we saw was, of course, yours, Mansi, and, uh, you know, a very heartfelt thing that you've uh, put out there, which is why we wanted you on this panel is the struggle for the last 13 months that we spoke about. But, you know, have you had uh, interactions and conversations with some of your patients and realized that they're perhaps not even aware about the dangers of this evolving virus? I would say the patients are not aware. That's okay. It's our job to educate them. But what is heartbreaking is educated citizens are not aware. So that is extremely heartbreaking and everybody really needs to understand. We do put up a lot of uh, efforts to convince people to get vaccinated and pull up masks, uh, people who come in contact with us. But it's the general public which is indirectly stressing us out and they really need to understand that mask is the first weapon that we have against, vac uh, against covid Vaccine is just 70 to 80 percent effective. If we have a double layered mask or an N95 mask, it is almost 95 percent effective. So please mask up people. You know, I think you put it very succinctly when you said, will we ever be able to get through this pandemic if the healthcare workers break down and give up? That's such an important point to make. That it has been a test, an examination and a battle for every single day in the past 13 months for healthcare workers and most of us are over the edge is masking up too much of an effort the dr mansi have you seen this around you your colleagues who've you know have had one of those days where they have crumbled under this pressure and not wanted to take it for one more day yes in fact a, a very good colleague of mine dr nidhi she has a one year old child and we talk almost every day how many days are going to, you know, go like this. And we try to help each other taking a day off, but it's just not possible. It's been 13 months and we've hardly taken two or three days off in the entire year. So it is extremely mentally exhausting for us. Our reserves are very, very low and uh, we do not have the enthusiasm or energy levels of the first wave. And the virus is more infectious, much more dangerous, affecting much more people. So, yes, please help us not have a breakdown by behaving responsibly. Uh, Dr. Venkat, would you also like to come in here and, you know, share some of your experiences? I'm sure it's extremely grueling day after day for you and your colleagues. Yeah, it is extremely difficult. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you become robotic and... Uh, 
it is you tend to function on autopilot which is extremely dangerous uh because you see i to produce a doctor a sub specialist and uh, there are there's an intensivist here there's a medical oncologist here it takes at least 10 to 12 years six years of mbbs three years of uh, md or dnb and an, another three years of sub specialization so even after that uh the path is very difficult because when we see a clear solution in front of us and uh, that solution not being implemented uh, it is very helpless so um and what happens is that uh, there will be a point when uh, people just break down and uh, you cannot produce uh, doctors overnight you cannot produce nurses overnight uh, the he- and everybody can only do a certain amount of work uh, there will be a time when uh, people will just raise their hand and say i don't want to do this anymore it is just not worth the time okay. and not worth uh, the money um it is it's not a question of uh, uh working uh, longer hours for extra money for any doctor uh it is just a question of uh, hoping that the patient gets better and goes home and the numbers come down but uh unfortunately the the every day is a new challenge because the numbers keep just increasing and uh, the stress gets uh, enormous and and, and the uh, knowledge and the awareness about the fact that this isn't going away tomorrow uh, about the fact that uh, this will continue for several more weeks and perhaps in uh, after a break there will be another wave um it, it just adds to the anxiety and i want to tell this to our viewers because this has been one of the bigger uh, fallouts that we've seen even within the medical fraternity the stress that they have gone through and what they deal with every day is also impacting their own health and not just physical health their own mental health as well there's uh their fa- for their family members who are also going through this day after day seeing them at work all of this can be at least made a little simple a little less difficult and a little less challenging if we do our bit if we simply like dr mansi was putting out if we simply just mask up every time we step out look at the doctors at work and they do this <coughs> for 6 hours 8 hours 12 hours 14 hours 18 hours wearing these pp kits and visors and gloves and everything and we can't simply wear a mask for a couple of hours when we step out then what is the point of expressing our gratitude to the medical fraternity when we genuinely don't care about what they're going to be going through for our mistakes they are the ones who have to pay for it even though it is our mistake dr shanavas if uh, you, you know how do you i mean have you had to tell some of your patients that even though their situation is a little serious or dire right now you can't really help them out because everything is occupied with covid related stuff now that is the saddest part of our job that uh, despite uh, seeing a patient who needs help desperately and needs it urgently but we are unable to provide it simply because the beds are not available or uh, the personnel are not available i have been receiving calls day and night i am receiving whatsapp text messages everything and people are sending their distress messages that we need a bed badly i tell you a very very sad incident which happened last night only in the uh, last night in the middle of the night i got a text message uh, somebody was looking for a bed they had been uh, to nearly you know, most of the hospitals in the delhi then they had been to noida then that point of time they were in ghaziabad and they were looking for a bed they texted me i too couldn't arrange a bed for them then in the morning uh, nearly uh, early in the morning i texted them back that what happened i was trying to follow up with them and the pay, and the person uh, the attendant of the patient 
said that we reached near it and we found a bed finally 5 a.m. in the morning. But sadly, 5.30, the patient died. It is so, so, so sad. We can't comprehend it unless we experience or we see these things. People are not comprehending them. We need to, we need to have some empathy. We need to learn from this, what is going on with others. We don't need to experience it with somebody of our own. People are really in a very bad situation. There is chaos. I request everybody to protect themselves, to protect their families, and do their bit to protect the, all the people and the country together. Thank you so much for that, that Dr. Shanawaz, and thank you to all of those who joined us in the first round. I really appreciate it, and I hope that the country listens to you. I mean, um, the only way I, I believe that perhaps the message will get received is when you all, the lifesavers, actually put out this message and speak up and say, look, we are going through the challenge and through the burden and the pain and the struggle. But all that you have to do to help us and support us is actually wear a mask. You don't need to light the candles. You don't need to bang the utensils. You don't need to say anything else except that you do your part and we do our part. So thank you to the first set of panelists who joined me. We had so many more. Uh, and I wish I could get more, but there's, there's only so much time in this one hour wheel. But I say good evening to Dr. Sonali Shetye, uh, who's joining us uh, from... Uh, Navi Mumbai and works in a hospital there. Uh, Dr. Amit Thadani, who's uh, joining us this evening as well, again works in uh, uh, with the Mumbai Hospital. Dr. Deepa Krishnamurthy uh, joining us from Bengaluru, works uh, in a hospital there. Dr. Lakshmi Lavanya uh, joins us this evening as well from Hyderabad, a senior consultant there. Dr. Akshay Yadav, resident doctor, who's working in Mumbai. Good evening to all of you. And Dr. La uh, Lavanya, uh, if I could start off with you. Uh, your one message to the people right now as we stare at two lakh cases every day, how can every Indian do their bit? Very good. Thank you so much, Mira, now uh, and Tanvi for uh, hosting this program and to, you know, highlight the importance of COVID-19 protocol by our beloved Indian fellow countrymen uh, in this pandemic. As we are rising in the second uh, curve right now, the second wave, with all the rising cases, I think it's a personal responsibility of every one of us to um, stay home, stay safe, have clean hands, uh, please put your mask on and don't participate in any of those social gatherings, social meetings, unnecessary outings and um, have a fear for your life. At least have fear for the life of those people who are beside you and who love you and those who are taking care of you, the governments, the scientists, the doctors, the, the workers who are uh, taking the responsibility of saving the society. So, I mean, uh, keep it in your mind every minute that we all have to do our bit because it is a team effort. We can't get India through the second wave of the pandemic, which is rushing at us, and we don't have the infrastructure to fill in. Uh, you, you'll have no idea how many people in Hyderabad, which is not even hit as badly as Mumbai or UP or Delhi. Here we have so many patients calling us for any doctors who can come to their houses because they did not have a bed or they need a, few, a little bit help of IV fluids or they need oxygen or they need remdesivir injections. So, uh, you know, there is so much shortage of infrastructure already and it is not even a flood of a case in Hyderabad. So you can see only with, the, you know, 4,000 cases which are positive every day as documented by the government, we are seeing this situation. So we don't know how many cases are actually being reported. Are they being reported? or not, and how many patients are actually sick or not. So we have no clear data. Yeah. We don't even know if the vaccines are going to be helpful completely. We don't even know how many of us got completely, you know, you know, completed the second dose of the vaccine. Only after the second dose, two weeks after the second dose, we'll have at least 80 to 90% protection with antibody response if we get the COVID virus. And people don't even know that with vaccine, they can still get the virus because there is no mask, there is no distancing, there is no hand hygiene. They can contract the virus because there is no mask, because they're going out and, and you know walking around in the public. So they have no idea that they can get the virus in spite of the vaccine. They think vaccine can protect them and so many of them are overconfident, not wearing their masks and roaming around. This will put a very high pressure, not just on you or your family, but the entire country. Yeah. So it is a high sense of responsibility that our nation needs to pick up right now. 
and um, uh, all of us have to stay home and stay safe and keep hand hygiene masking and take up this you know sense of respect for all the covid warriors who are working so hard day and night uh, so many of them are in critical care pulmonary care cardiology on those intensive care all the nurses the technicians Absolutely. who are wrapped up in those pp kits forever 24 hours all 365 days we need to salute them and you know we need to keep ourselves responsible at least for that gang of people who are working I, you know sometimes i feel i feel so ashamed that you know, we in the non medical uh, uh, community won't even bother to mask up or wear that yes. one pp kit we dread at the thought of wearing that pp kit for a 2 hour flight if we have to travel um and, and if uh, viewers who are watching this have actually gone through that experience then you know how hard it is so imagine uh, what our doctors and nurses are going through because they're wearing it effectively every single day with then face shields and gloves uh, for 12 hours 14 hours non stop and they've done this for 13 months we don't know for how much longer they'll have to do uh, let me uh, go across to dr akshay and ask him you know statistics dr akshay is one thing that we keep telling our viewers but it's also the 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 human side of it how what you have to face the barrage the tsunami of patients and the family members each one of them extremely worried and concerned and perhaps in a very serious condition uh Tell us a little bit about what your experience has been. I simply want to do that so that people are aware about the gravity of situation inside the hospitals. Yeah, greetings everyone. I hope uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are. So I yeah. So I will start uh, with uh, an anecdote. Uh it was uh my morning shift in uh, December 2020. I went I received one young patient, 40 42 years old female patient. She was very uh, stable. By afternoon my, uh, when my shift was ending she deteriorated by evening she was went uh, she was on ventilator and by night we had to declare her so you can understand the intensity and this was in december 2020 now when the amount of youngsters becoming positive has increased to a, a greater level the intensity you can understand uh, this uh, tsunami of which you are talking of is uh, i mean uh, it is bigger than a tsunami and it is affecting almost everyone and uh, if i tell you uh, in a state like maharashtra where lockdown is now imposed uh, if i if i just cross the road while i go my uh, to my hostel i am a resident doctor working in sain hospital and also in the covid care centers of mcgm i could appreciate at least 12 vehicles in a span of 10 seconds who are moving purposelessly uh, this was 10 days ago now the uh, curb is more strict but then you can understand if the people are not getting the point of this uh, restriction then uh, uh, i mean uh, they they uh, will they understand only after coming uh, directly to to the hospital after seeing exact situation see when we declare a patient it is a very emotional thing which we have to do uh, it is not easier for us uh, earlier also now also like uh, we have to, uh, we have to just counsel them we have to sometimes uh, give false hope to all uh, all the relatives so uh, i think uh, if this is the time if if we don't understand now uh, we will have to face a bigger impact also the beds oxygen availability doctor the availability of doctors even if uh, the government government is working at its best even if the government provide you beds even if they uh, bring oxygen uh, cutting down the supply to industries where will they bring doctors from and even if they bring doctors will suffer violence from you because ultimately you will blame us that the infrastructure is not there that uh, this thing is not there that thing is not there but then ultimately you have to understand if the patient load is controlled doctors can manage you properly and because of covid patients uh, i trust uh, i uh, say i swear uh, the non covid work burden is incre- going to increase yeah. sustainably like uh, dr mansi i guess from bangalore was telling uh, she was a consultant oncologist ma'am was saying that uh, the uh, the cancer patients are suffering not just cancer patients we are seeing the elective patients which are getting delayed they are suffering the most and uh, we are ignoring that part see we the resident doctors have slept eating just a few palaji biscuits so that you all can eat nicely in your home so i just request everyone that be uh, just uh, don't believe on rumors uh, get yourself vaccinated also if you are not staying at home this time this is not just a uh, this is not just a request i think you can uh, take it as a warning also if you are not staying at home this time you will have to definitely come to the hospital 
Uh, thank you, ma'am. Absolutely, and That's so it. well, that is all so my side. well put. Uh, thank you for that, Doctor Akshay. Uh, you know, when when I listen to this and when I see it sometimes myself, um, Doctor Sonali, I wonder if you know some of you will end up getting some rage issues when when you work sixteen hours a day and then you step out and you see people not caring at all, uh, roaming around as if everything is okay. I mean, what goes on in your mind to say we're doing all of this for you guys, and you won't even follow the basic rules? Does that happen to you, Doctor Sonali? Have you ever yes. felt like that? See, basically, happens is people have. Be yes, I have. I have. See, we are uh, giving our time. We are. Away from our family, we are leaving our family behind and giving you time and giving the patient time. So there should be a little bit of sensitivity and respect that should be shown towards a doctor, not just in the hospital but in daily life on the road also. When we see people not wearing masks, when we see people gathering around, we feel our efforts. Somewhere we feel our efforts are being stopped. Because it is just not the hospitals that are curing the patients, but outside the hospital, the major number of patients are outside the hospital. They are the ones who are spreading the disease. In the hospital, we are curing the disease, but outside, we are spreading the disease. So, people from outside the world, uh, outside the hospital, should be aware that we are the ones who are stopping the disease and not the ones in the hospital. We really feel bad. With a lot of awareness, with a lot of vaccination, also people are really not getting the seriousness of it. But I think that such debates and such broadcasts maybe, maybe put us ahead and you know have one-to-one -one talk with the patients that what we are going through. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is the hope. We hope it works. Uh, I don't know what else, but we've tried so many other things uh, and we are now trying this. A lot of the messages that I saw from you, the medical community on, on Twitter and the posts that you all are putting up actually uh, made me realize that this is this is a message and yours is the voice that needs to be put across to people, Dr. Ambit Thadani. Uh, at the end of the day, you are all the ones who have to uh, uh, tell a family about the seriousness of the case who have to treat them or give them the bad news day after day after day. Uh, and there is no letting up. There is no off day for you. Yes, we do not have any off days. Uh, uh, it's virtually a 24-7 job. And... Uh, it's been a very, very relentless uh, onslaught on our mental health, you can say, and the physical part of it also is very challenging. Wearing a PPE is the least of our problems. It's what you do when you go back home because your exposure never stops, right? Uh, uh, even if you're sitting in your OPD, which uh, your exposure will just continue. And, uh, you know, people just don't get it somehow. A lot of people still don't get it that you don't, your voice comes across even if you don't pull that damn mask down. Why do you have to talk to people pulling the mask down? It just doesn't make any sense, right? And you're infecting others directly with that. I have family members who have gotten infected in this way. I mean, what do you tell to outsiders? Uh, I would just say the mask is your best defense. And uh, definitely do not go out of home without a mask. And do not assume that the other person is absolutely clean. Uh, it's invariably the opposite. In, a, in the middle of a pandemic, you have to just assume that everybody around you is a potential carrier of the disease. So wear a mask. Make sure that you follow your basic rules. By now, everyone has drilled enough of it into everybody's head. Uh, wear a mask. Try to maintain as much distancing as possible. In big metros, it's very difficult. But of course, you can... Uh, just keep it above your nose and below your chin. Yes, and, and one would think those are not the things you need to emphasize, but they are. Uh, the exact placement of a mask has been the one of the biggest challenges where it's everywhere else except covering your mouth and the nose. And you said, you know, how difficult is it to know that we can still hear you while wearing the mask? I think is a very important point to make as well. But Dr. Deepak, good evening to you. Uh, good evening. Uh, we, 
what do you tell people and how do you explain it to them when you're all around, we're seeing large gatherings, we're seeing festivals being celebrated and are being allowed to be celebrated as if there is no tomorrow, as if there is no COVID. We're seeing political rallies being carried out. Uh, and we have politicians uh, uh, and, and voices from the various states and governments saying that, well, there is COVID's gone. You don't need to wear a mask. Uh, how do you then tell people that, no, all of this is not true? This is extremely serious. See, this has been a very difficult battle on uh, many fronts. Uh, one, of course, the virus is something which we have come to know about recently. Uh, the virus wasn't known to us. We did not know anything about it uh, one and a half years ago. We doctors are also trying to read up, trying to learn. World over virologists, researchers, doctors, physicians, across streams, across specialities are trying to fight this virus in their own way. Uh, one very disheartening uh, part, uh, as some of my colleagues mentioned earlier, is the misinformation campaign. Unfortunately, educated people are trying to question if the virus really exists. Uh, is the vaccine really effective? On one side, there are some people who will ask us, science is so much advanced, why is the vi uh, vaccine not coming out? And once the vaccine has come out, people want to ask, is the vaccine really safe? Is it really effective? It came out so fast. I mean, on one hand, you want it to come out fast. On one hand, you doubt once it comes out fast. I mean, we are full of doubts. We are full of um, uh, scare. We are full of rumors. This, unfortunately, has put a lot of setbacks in this fight against the virus, I feel. Uh, educated people need to um, uh, educate more people who are unaware uh, people have to be conscious about what they talk, what they put out on social media. Um, we doctors try our best on every level, try, trying to put out the right information, trying to tell people what needs to be done. But there is always, uh, as, as, as the adage goes, you know, to put out one good thing, one right thing out there among the population takes maybe 100 different people telling it all the time. And it just takes one irresponsible tweet or one irresponsible uh, statement in the uh, media by one celebrity or somebody who is more popular and all the hard work is gone. And people tend to believe that one wrong um, information, that one wrong opinion and try to uh, get misguided. Uh, so, so information and misinformation imbalance is, I think, one of the uh, most difficult part of this uh, battle against COVID. More difficult than the virus is the misinformation. I mean about it. I actually, and you know, I I think that's one thing which is common between me and you all is this battling this misinformation and the stuff that comes on WhatsApp universities. And, uh, and Dr. Thadani, he, he, like you said, you know, he, 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 even in our circles, in our family members and friends, all of this misinformation that goes around. How do you tackle it? I mean, how, at what point do you then? draw the line and say, okay, no, I, maybe I'm done for the day correcting people and giving them the right information. Yeah, the thing is that I'm a very patient guy. <laughs> so no matter how many times uh, people do make mistakes, I find my best justified. And uh, it's our job. It's part of what you do. You know, you, you just have to give them the correct information. Uh, so if there is someone who is obviously saying something which is way out of the world, uh, you know, you would want to correct that person. Uh, and Dr. Lavanya, would you like to also come in on this? And, and you, you know, yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the administration as well, the local authorities in getting this message out. I mean, what you are all having to do, um, you know, if, if, if everybody else had probably got the message out, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. I think the misinformation is really the killer. It, it just creates so much panic. More than the pandemic, the panic of the misinformation just kills a lot of People. It just does a psychological torture for many of them, and it spreads the fire of uh, panic around to other people also. And especially when an unintelligent person or a foolish person takes up a social media and puts it out, that becomes just a rage, and uh, you know it it becomes unstoppable because all the negative things and the wrong things and the foolish things gets uh, broadcasted much more at a pace than the truth. You know, you all you know it as a media person. 
So, I mean, you know, we need to really take it up as a personal responsibility to correct that misinformation, uh, clear the taboos and, you know, let the people know what is correct and that is not right. We have to quote the article, quote some publication or data if possible because we are from the scientific background. And also not only doctors, the media, the officials and all the educated people. It could be any other profession, but they're educated, they're aware, they have the right knowledge. They should take it up as, an, as a responsibility at this hour of need and hour of emergency in this uh, point of pandemic. Not only the people, but also the government officials, the Department of Health and Education and the, the Environmental Sciences and uh, the administrations such as the municipal corporations and even the uh, private corporations and the NGOs. They all should form up a network and release uh, you know, information with posters or uh, uh, you know, uh, get active on social media have some Facebook live programs or Zoom platform and, you know, go on YouTube and release those videos. All those people who think you have the knowledge should be able to spread the knowledge. The yes. only method to correct the misinformation is to actually propagate the correct information and make an effort and spend the extra time to do that. All those doctors who are not on active field area of patient care, who are in a lesser cumbersome area, the super specialists who are not in the hospital taking care of the covid they should make an effort to make these videos or small clips of, you know, messages and stuff like that uh, with the photo caption or posters and release in social media. Now, all the doctors and educated people should take it up as a personal responsibility to propagate. Yeah. It is about time that we need to propagate. Another thing is I have, we always tell our patients not to propagate. All those patients who come to us with misinformation or misconception, it is our duty to correct it. And tell them to take it up as a challenge to at least spread it to another 10, 50 people of their family or acquaintance. Um, you know, it is one person can spread it to 10 to 50 people of their acquaintance, all the correct information about the vaccine, the side effects, the contraindications, uh, you know, the double dosing, the gap between the dosing, uh, the pandemic, the second wave, the treatments available, and how should you get it tested? How should you keep away from other people, you know, the prevention you, you aspect know, of the pandemic? Dr. Lavanya, Every single thing. You're absolutely yeah. right there. And, and and I think people will believe that more. People believe it more when it comes to them in one of these groups as from somebody they know, then they tend yes. to sometimes when it comes from authorities, uh, yes. you know, or even watch they watch on television channels or, 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 or uh, you know, verified accounts. So I, I get the point that you're making. And all I can say is if you all start putting out these videos, we will try our best to propagate them as much as we can. And, I, and a big thank you to all of you for coming here and putting this message across. Uh, uh, I hope we don't have to do another round like this again. But if it does require and if there is a need and the message doesn't get across, then I will be more than willing to get more and more doctors and nurses and those from the medical fraternity to make people understand just how serious the situation is and to appeal to them. And I appeal on behalf of doctors uh, right now. I appeal to all of you. Think about them and what they and their families are going through because of our carelessness. So let's stop being so callous about this pandemic. Thank you for joining us.